Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the country's biggest stars and some of my favourite people. The delicious Claire Nazir. How are you? Alex, hello. How are you doing? Oh, you were marvellous to wake up with in the morning. So many did. Oh, bless you. I'm the other side of the day now. Thank oh, you. No. Well, I'm thrilled for you because there's nothing more depressing than seeing that alarm going off at Arpas 2 in the morning, is there? We've all done it, haven't we? And, it, you know, it is, it is hard. And you do feel sort of jet-lagged a lot of the time. And my heart goes out to people who still work shifts. And luckily, my day seems to be a bit more organised now. But when you have kids, that's got, got to be the way. Mm. I made the decision about five years ago that no matter how big the slot is and breakfast is the biggest slot, it's just not worth ruining your life over. You put on about 27 stone and you look like death, don't you? <laughs> that's right. I mean, I did 12 years at GMTV and I travelled around the country most weeks. And it was brilliant, but, you know, I'm older than I was then. And you just have to move with the times in your body, really. And I'm very happy in the zone I'm in now, working for Channel 5 in the Met Office. You are knocking on a bit now, Claire. I mean, we can see from all the pictures. I mean, it's sad, really, isn't it? I suppose that's the one thing about telly. You do literally see yourself evolve in front of the nation, don't you? Well, in a way, but still smoke and mirrors, you know, bright lights. I just turn up the lighting so it's a bit more bleaching on my face and it's sort of gets rid of all those wrinkles and you know we can do a lot to keep ourselves you looking useful on screen that's what i'm going to say do you know what i love about you as well you always look like you wanted to be there and that's got to be tough when you've got things going on at home like babies and children and husbands and things like that is that the toughest thing to appear to want to be there at 605 on a tuesday morning no to be honest alex i absolutely loved my job every day i felt very lucky to be working for such a brilliant organization and delivering weather and news um but 12 years was probably enough and you know even now when my phone goes and it's a blocked number i always think oh that's the producer of breakfast tv sending me somewhere i don't want to go <laughs> so, yeah, it, it was the time it was a place and um I'm, and, you know, I'm working for a great news group now, so from my point of view, things just evolve and move on, and mm. it's great to be still working in weather. Yeah, we're going to talk about your life now in a moment, but first let's talk about what you're here to talk about, which is yeah. pollen. It's that time of year again when they all start sniffing and sneezing, isn't it? It is, and there's some revealing, um, there's some revealing facts that's come out of this review from Boots UK, which says 89% of people don't realise that their hay fever symptoms can actually be worse in the city rather than the countryside. And actually, that surprised me as well. Hmm. And the reason why that is, is something that is termed pollination, which is almost the perfect storm of pollen count, along with high pollution levels. And obviously, that will affect people in the city rather than the countryside. And there's hotspots all around the country, from London to Cardiff to Glasgow and Leeds and Birmingham. And these people may suffer from hay fever, but even when the pollen count is low, their hay fever symptoms could still be like it's a day of high counts, and that's because the pollen level, uh, the pollution levels are high as well. I guess the pollen's got nowhere to go. Is that the theory, that if you're in the middle of a sort of city like London, where, where is it going to go? There's so much pollution, it can't rise above it, and th there's so many walls around you, it's sort of stuck there, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I lived in London for many years, and I was living very close to the A1, which is four lanes of traffic going into London. And certain times of the day, the year, it was particularly bad. And my daughter would really wake up with quite a bad cough. Mm. Now, you know, air pollution in some respects can't be seen, but it doesn't mean to say it's not there. So if people are vulnerable and susceptible, susceptible to pollen anyway, it, the symptoms can just be worse on those sorts of days. And, you know, high pressure is building now. The weather conditions are great for some fine and sunny weather, dry weather, higher temperatures. But along with that, the pollen count is high and air pollution levels are going to rise over the next few days. And I guess if you go somewhere like Boots, you'll see on the counter 700,000 different things that can help. Their job is to sort of guide you in the right direction, depending on how bad it is and where you are in the country. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we all swear by our, our local pharmacists, don't we? And they're brilliant. They're a font of information and they give the right information for your symptoms. So, yeah, I mean, that's the advice, is to you know, talk to your local pharmacist and, and get the right solution to what you're suffering with. And with hay fever, it can be awful for people. I mean, we're coming into the birch pollen season. A lot of people suffer from it, and it peaks mm. next week. But combined with that, high pressure in charge, lighter breezes, the air pollution is going to rise as well. So... You, you can imagine what that's going to do to millions of people across the country and in particular in the city. 
You know when you do that thing, Claire, you just did then with your voice, where you make it sound like you're going into weather. How long did it take <laughs> you to do that to sound natural? Because it's an amazing gift. I've tried to do that, and it's not easy, is it? You just have to imagine you're having a conversation mm. with one person, and that's the thing, you know, on television, on radio. Um, I now do a podcast, a weather podcast, and it's the same thing. They don't want the radio for a voice. They want somebody, and you know this better than anyone, Alex. It's a conversation, isn't it? Right. It's not enunciating and you know keeping that voice on a level where it's dipping up and down because that's how you've been trained as a broadcaster it's interesting in america i was looking at some research recently that the news channels are bigger than ever and weather and travel still have a huge place you'd think with the iphone nobody would care but it's some somehow we don't trust the weather on our phones we want it from someone like you isn't it interesting how you've sort of ridden the storm of millennials and 2018 technology weather is a talking point in the uk as well as the us and particularly over the last six months it really has been and we've been really really busy i think there is a place for every type of weather broadcast out there whether it's um, a presented one where you're sort of adding value to the data or whether you just want the data but sometimes the data doesn't really mean anything you want someone to say it's going to feel better than yesterday the wind's going to feel colder than two days ago you know, you want someone to relate that information to a point where you know what it's going to feel like. And that's mm. why there's always going to be a place for a, a weather presenter. I mean, I work for the Met Office and we do a presented forecast on the Met Office app. So it combines all the data along with a forecast, which is updated four times a day. So from my point of view, we're sort of, we're ticking every box there. Um, so, yeah, some people will just want a, snap, a snapshot of what's going on in their town. Other people want an overview and see sort of the mobility of the weather and where it's coming from and why it's happening. And you're a meteorologist. You're not a weather presenter. It did go in a strange direction for a while where it all became very sexy without any knowledge behind it. I mean, you're an incredibly bright woman when I look at your CV. You've done a lot and worked hard to get there, haven't you? Oh, you're very kind to say so, to be honest, Alex. I mean, it's, you know, I, I'm... As a child, I just loved meteorology and I've just worked with it. I'm a bit of a geek, really, in a way. And my husband says I can be very boring when I talk about the weather. <laughs> but yeah, you know him as well as I do. And, you know, he says what he thinks, doesn't he? Um, but it, I've been very lucky to have a career which has spanned many, many decades and to be able to talk about my specialist subject. Now, there was a time where there was a different type of weather presenter that was presenting on TV and on radio, but there is a place for both. You know, if people can communicate something well, whether they're an expert or not, as long as they've been briefed by an expert, then they can relate that information well. You've been married to Chris Hawkins now for a while. I worked with him about 20 years ago at Radio yeah. Nottingham. And you tend to keep yourselves quite private. And I love that. It's old school. You go about your public life publicly and your private life privately. Is that important to you that you don't cross the line? Because so many fall at the first hurdle, don't they? Uh, and when we lived in London and I was on GMTV every day, there were there was the paparazzi outside our house and other celebrities' house. I was living in Islington at the time. And it was a bit tricky. There were days where I was in the newspaper because of the amount of cellulite was on my legs or because I was just walking my daughter up and down the road. Um, and it wasn't, it was, I never got into weather to be a celebrity. I got into weather because I love it. And, you know, television is just part and parcel of that. And Chris is the same. You know, he loves the radio. He loves music. He loves talking politics as well. Mm. And so our private life is something very different from other celebrities who perhaps enjoy and benefit from being in the limelight more but it's not really our bag we do we, we occasionally do corporates to get about and doing stuff but you know i think when i'm doing the weather i know people want to get information from me rather mm. than watch me yet yeah, there is a huge appetite for you personally you've only got to google you to see the amount of articles it is extraordinary isn't it how interested people are in you especially photographers and newspapers it's crazy, really. It really is when there's big news stories around the world. And, you know, there is now very, there's this, like, celebrity, reality celebrity market. And every time you look at a newspaper or a magazine, somebody's on the front who was in a reality show. Mm. However, you know, their personalities are dynamic. They've obviously got something to say for themselves, which adds value to other people's lives. Or they're just fascinated by the, the, their lives and how dynamic they are. Or crazy, you know, whatever mm. way you want to put it. Um, and I'm sort of not really part of that, really, but I still find it quite fascinating. 
And then again, it seems like you've opted not to do the big brothers and things like that. Is that something you would ever consider or are you a meteorologist that reads the weather and that's it? <laughs> I, you know, I just don't think I would ever contemplate doing big brother. I think that perhaps comes, <laughs> I'm saying this in, in the lightest <laughs> way at the end of a career. <laughs> <laughs> in the nicest possible way, you know, but it's, it's I've done a few dancey things, etc. But I'm much more of a have a much more of a sporty element to my life and if I was offered mm. somewhere you know I could really extend my range of skills then that's very different like rock climbing or something but if it's just sitting with a bunch of other celebrities and you know mm. drinking wine and making light conversation I don't think that's really me no farting in a corner on I'm a celeb oh for 24 goodness. hours a day does seem a bit draining and yeah. then of course we look at you physically and we don't want ugly people on the telly I, I wonder and I hate having to ask this question that I do these days but have you ever felt like an editor said to you could you be more glam because we want to be more sexy as a program or has that never been a problem for you I think with weather not really I mean I've got my own style and mm. um I'm not that sexy, high fashion fashionista, you know, I'm, I'm never going to be. Um, I think that's fine. And actually, a lot of people, they want to watch the weather. They don't want to be off put by me wearing club clothes on the, you know, the news in an eve of an evening. Um, so I try and keep myself in shape. And certainly in my age, I want to feel youthful. And certainly my daughter makes me feel like that as well. She's only eight. Um, so yeah, I want to look good on television. Everybody does, but I'm, um, you know, some people go that extra mile, and, and that's not really me. And it's, you know, I'm, it's, I'm, I work in news, mm. so everything is topical and it's current, and it's not very celeb oriented. You know, it, it's science, it's, it's weather, and it's, it's what my bag is, and, and I hope I, I, I deliver a good job. You're incredibly good at it. When that five four three two one comes in your ear, does it ever get old when you know you're going to be live to the nation? And if you cock it up, we're all going to see it. Yeah, I've, I have messed it up a few times. <laughs> you know, I was on GMTV once, and a wasp stung me, which wasn't a great moment. Wow. And I actually swore on GMTV once, and by mistake, it was a very long morning. So these things happen, and they all get picked up by YouTube, don't they? But I, there's a real buzz when it comes to television and radio, and I absolutely love it. Um, but behind the scenes, I love talking to the scientists, the forecasters, mm. and really finding out the minutiae and learning every day about weather and meteorology. And the podcast I'm doing now, which is called Under the Weather, it's all about talking about weather in, on a left-field perspective. So we talk about things like space weather and geoengineering and nuclear winters. And all that stuff just adds to my knowledge. And also it's something which fascinates lots of people, lots of people with curious minds. I think you're incredibly charming and warm to watch on the TV. And we need to get you out, certainly during the winter when it's minus 17 degrees and you're <laughs> stood in the middle of a field in Yorkshire somewhere. I think yeah, that's always that's fun. Right. Claire is here. Thank you so much for your time. It is pollen season. Get down to Boots and sort yourself out. They've got all the advice there. And you can speak to the pharmacist. Claire, lovely to talk to you. Some love to Chris. Thank you, Alex.